Okay, we're at 21 attendees, so I'm gonna kick us off. All right. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks for being here today with us uh, on behalf of the AFF, the Arab Foundations Forum and our amazing um, panelists. I'm, uh, I wanna welcome you to today's conversation on localization of development and the relationship between the funder and the local civil society sector. So in this moment, I think as we reflect or begin to reflect on our post COVID normal, um, I think the issue of localization is top of mind and the impact that the pandemic had on the development and the aid sector kind of highlighted the critical role that local development and local organizations play in delivery, dissemination of aid, support, et cetera. Um, so I'm on this note, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. We have an, an incredible, incredibly rich conversation ready to go. Um, and I will hand it over to our wonderful moderator, Dr. Nohan Mekewi, um, to kick us off. I promise this will be a very engaging and very deeply thought provoking conversation. Uh, so please be ready to ask your questions. We have um, a Q&A panel, you should have a Q&A panel on your Zoom platform to allow you to ask any questions that you have for the panelists. We have plenty of time um, for you to be able to ask questions and give some feedback. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And Noha, I'll kick it off to you and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Naila. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you uh, joining us today for this uh, exciting conversation. I am uh, looking forward to it as much as most of you are. Um, thank you, uh, AFF, uh, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, the conversation is truly important and timely as the, wor as the world we live in uh, sees deep transformations and deep disruptions. Um, some of what you will hear today will require um, appetite for disruption, uh, particularly of power imbalances uh, in the development uh, industry. Uh, and some of what you will hear today will be extremely practical and um, constructive forward looking uh, um, information based on our panelists field experience um, as participants and stakeholders in development. Um, the panel today is a microcosm of the large and complex ecosystem of development. It has representatives from strategic philanthropy organizations uh, in the Arab world, as well as uh, not-for-profit organizations that see themselves as facilitators of development and of the relationship between local communities and big funding agencies, as well as not-for-profit organizations that are working on creative solutions to solve social, economic, and cultural challenges facing many of our countries in our region. The reason why we thought of today's conversation is that we know that philanthropy initiatives can have long lasting impacts on the way communities live and operate. But we also know that funding priorities often focus on what some of the donors have set for themselves as objectives and indicators of success in their own strategic plans. Sometimes without enough knowledge of local practices and social structure programs, can hit obstacles, fail or even create new challenges for the people they were trying to empower. Working in an environment of persistent conflict and restrictive legislation and lacking data about uh, the philanthropy sector and the development field, all of that has gotten the donors used to um, big donor-led aid that avoids risk and tries to avoid inadvertently innovation as well. With or without intention, communities and also governments are sidelined in program design and implementation in order to avoid risk. Foundations and individual donors feel their money is safer if given to a big name international agency. Often private philanthropic organizations and government development funds prefer to replicate programs that have worked elsewhere. Uh, used by other big uh, funding agencies in order to avoid any risk of investment in new or starting or small 
grassroots solutions, although those grassroots solutions could be more effective and less costly. As donors go for the easier option, they inadvertently perpetuate the power imbalance that has long overshadowed the sector, a power imbalance that often downplays the instinct and the experience of local communities. It doesn't help that we don't have data, high quality data on the development sector and Arab philanthropy uh, sector, because lack of data means lack of ability to document the experiences of what works and what doesn't. How do we shift the sector away from top-down thinking toward more localized thinking? How do we effectively address the factors that have perpetuated this power imbalance? And what does the most effective relationship between funders and local communities look like? These are the kinds of questions that we will be talking about today. It will take time to tackle such questions effectively, but existing research shows that there are some ways in which philanthropic practices and donations can be localized, including empowering communities to develop and maintain the projects that are designed to support them, bringing local voices into the decision-making process from start to end and beyond. If we get it right, we will have been able to transform development industry into community-centered, sustainable, inclusive development. That's what we are about today in this conversation. And helping me to carry this conversation on today is a fantastic panel that includes Nelson Amaya, policy analyst from the OECD Center on Philanthropy, Mona Abbas, chief executive officer of the Asfari Foundation, Nicholas Dawalibi, Deputy Director of Swiss Contact Lebanon, and Amira Fikri, Business Development Manager in En Route Development. I thank all of them for joining me today. I will start by introducing each speaker before he or she speaks. Uh, then we'll have a short uh, round of conversations, and then I'll open up the Q&A for you to pose your questions to our panel before we end with a hard uh, stop at uh, four o'clock maximum. Keep your questions coming in the chat or question and answer room. We will be monitoring them and um, we will uh, get to them um, as soon as we can once our panelists have been given a chance to kick us off with a framing from their side and answering a couple of questions from my side. We'll start with Nelson Amaya, policy analyst with OECD. Nelson leads research at the OECD Center on Philanthropy. He has over a decade of experience in applied research for public policy in areas like development finance, justice, public finance, and procurement. He has worked for the OECD Governance Directorate, the Governance Global Practice at the World Bank Group, and was an advisor at the National Planning Department of Colombia. Nelson is a Colombian economist specialized in applied statistics and data science. Nelson, over to you. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks also to Naila and to Walid for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be able to discuss uh, this, this research and, and, and getting to know the sector and all of its intricacies. Um, to maybe to, to, to I, I would like to give a, a perspective basically with three points to get us started. The first one is um, we need to narrow down a little bit what we understand for localization, because there are lots of different angles to localization. And if we don't narrow them down, we might go in different directions. Just to give you an example, I ran, I, I, I saw a very, uh, I'll tell you in a second, a, a very problematic definition of, of localization that I found from a very reputable and large international NGO. The second point is what exactly is uh, what, what we'd like to posit as the localization problem. So the localization will ultimately be seen as, as, a, as an issue that needs to be resolved between donors, recipients, intermediary organizations, and what's the call and kind of the, the way the whole sector operates. And finally, uh, my third point will be around why uh, there's no such thing as a single solution to localization. Like localization is a multi-headed problem. It needs to be approached in different places and different ways. Uh, and we need to be aware of that. The solutions for this are different in different places. So um, just to get us started, 
I uh, listen to this. I'm going to read it because I don't want to. Uh, this look this definition of localization. Localization means increasing international investment and respect for the role of local actors, with the goal of increasing reach, effectiveness, and accountability of humanitarian actions. This is a very specific definition of localization that actually has as many positive points as it has negative points, because it defines localization only as increasing in giving. So our reduction in giving will be automatically seen as a delocalization type of investment. It does have a big plus with the respect of local actors, but it only addresses humanitarian giving. And we already know that philanthropy goes way beyond humanitarian giving. So this is very limited, but it already gives us the idea that donor awareness and consideration of the history, the local context, and the present of where this is actually going to, uh, where, where the funding is going to be deployed is very important. And as Noah mentioned already, the focus and the shifting of decision-making and power between the donor and the grantee plays a big part in how the solution is either bottom-up or top-down. The second point is to what extent are donors, uh, to what, what we call, at, at least from, from our perspective, the localization problem, we see it as a search and a delegation problem. International donors, particularly sitting in their New York offices or San Francisco offices, have very little visibility to know where exactly is the right NGO in Burkina Faso that they need to be able to locate and give resources to because they will do a good job. So this is a very costly endeavor. Just to give you an example that I looked up right before this call, uh, I looked at the, the big uh, publication of giving from Yield Giving, which is the big uh, recently published information from Mackenzie Scott. Uh, she uh, gave around 14 billion of, uh, in donations over the past two years, I think is the fastest and biggest deployment of philanthropy that has ever happened. And I actually calculated how much went to international organizations in developing countries versus how much is stayed in the US. And I won't do a poll right now, but I can tell you that less than 5% of the grants went abroad and less than 4% of the funding actually went abroad. So an organization defined as yield of giving out control of yielding the control of philanthropic power has not yet been able to identify the right partners because of a localization problem, because they're very difficult to, to, to establish. We see this all over the place. In our research in Colombia, in China, and in India, we see the neighborhood effect. Philanthropic donors tend to give at arm's length reach, wherever it's convenient, wherever it's easier for them to deploy it, where, which ends up usually being in high developed uh, regions and uh, more economically developed communities. So where, where do we stand with this? How do we solve this, this localization problem? Uh, I think there are many ways. Uh, it's a permanent state of discovery from what we've seen. We've seen different community solutions in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in North Africa. Uh, and I think uh, we'll be very happy to, to discuss what we've seen from the OECD on how to uh, kind of cut across this, this big problem. Thank you very much, Nelson, for kicking us off with this definition. And I appreciate very much your uh, last phrase coined permanent state of discovery uh, because it certainly is given that as you said localization stands challenged by the feeling that I don't know those local partners um, I may not be able to assess their capacities all the way to how do I trust them um, and these are big questions that are um, making it difficult for the localization agenda to actually um, be, to expand, to cover more, more of the sector. Um, a permanent state of discovery that takes me to a second uh, set of experiences that uh, Muna will um, summarize for us with her kickoff. Uh, Muna Abbas, 
um, the chief executive officer of the Asfari Foundation. She joined the Asfari Foundation uh, with 25 years of experience in the humanitarian and development sectors. Prior to joining the Asfari Foundation as its executive uh, chief executive officer, Mona was the country director for Plan International in Jordan. She built programs to support both Jordanian and refugee communities across the country and established a wide network advocating for gender equality and youth empowerment. She also worked with Save the Children and UNRWA. We are happy to have Mona with us today because just by her uh, biography, uh, she exemplifies the ecosystem of development that we are talking about today as having the responsibility of localization. She worked with the internationals and now she leads um, one of the leading and most impactful Arab strategic philanthropies uh, in, the, in the Arab region. Mona, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Noha, for the introduction and uh, thank you for uh, Naila and Walid for the opportunity uh, uh, to give me the, 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 the space to talk and, uh, among our colleagues, or my colleagues here on the, on the panel. Uh, it is an important topic and it is a bit sensitive uh, as well, especially that um, I, uh, I can say that coming from um, an international NGO background and, and working on that side of, of, of the equation. And now I'm working, as you mentioned, Noha, with uh, the Asfari Foundation is one of the leading philanthropies uh, in, in the region, advocating and, and promoting working with local communities and local civil society. I think that I will, I will mention a number of my observations uh, and takeaways from, from that experience and reflecting on, on our topic today. Um, we need, before start talking about localization uh, in the development sector, I think we need to acknowledge the historical legacy um, uh, of the aid and development sector, uh, which is the colonial legacy uh, of this sector. Uh, many former co formal colonial uh, powers became now the, the providers of aid uh, for, for the countries that they have been uh, colonizing in, in the past uh, few centuries. Uh, and it goes back to, to, to centuries, uh, as I mentioned. And now bringing, of course, this uh, historical connection uh, creating structural and systematic power dynamics that enforces um, neo-colonial relationships. Uh, and we know that many of the institutional donors uh, and aid uh, agencies are linked to their uh, political um, uh, departments in their countries, and they are seen as the, 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 an arm uh, and development arm of their political um, uh, agendas and, and governments. And we can see uh, globally how the, um, the aid uh, is, is focused and taking directions based on, on the political interests of these funding countries. So this is something that we have to acknowledge if we want to talk about localization and the decolonization of the uh, aid and development uh, sector. Um, we, 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 we need also to acknowledge that the aid programs and the development programs are very much Western top-down uh, and overlooking the local knowledge and the traditions and the indigenous culture and practices, uh, reflecting the, the cultural superiority inherited from that colonial era. Uh, so we cannot talk about localization without talking about decolonization of, of the sector. And it, 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 it's not easy, just it, it's not as easy as talking about it. It's much easier to talk about it. We, and I know that number of, of international NGOs and even the, the funding agencies are addressing this, this issue and they're making a lot of reviews uh, on the way they are doing their work and their language and their discourse and their narrative uh, to challenge the inherited uh, structures and the inherited uh, uh, un unbalanced uh, power dynamics. But uh, bringing this into practice is, is 
way more difficult than talking about it. It needs uh, a lot of courage to, to, to address um, structural and uh, systematic um, uh, power dynamics that is promoting, as I said, the, the white superiority and, and Eurocentric and Western-centric uh, models and ways of thinking and generating knowledge as well. Um, this this uh, uh, as i can give an example uh, very quick example and you can elaborate later the language for example the the languages used in this sector are the colonial languages uh, uh, making language uh, uh, a significant barrier uh, of understanding uh, local communities uh, and, and hindering effective participation and and and, um, and ownership uh, so we need to have more to encourage promoting uh, multilingual approaches uh, using local languages to make sure that we are more inclusive and, and uh, saying that is 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 something and making this uh, into a practice is, is something uh, something else, especially that using for, again, uh, the language issues that we attract usually, even in, in, in our sector, even when we hire a local expertise and we will work with local agencies, we usually attract those who are Western educated uh, that can use foreign languages, uh, um, easily, they're educated in the West, they're influenced by this, uh, again, uh, Western-centric uh, way of models and, and approaches. Uh, and they're also alienated from their local communities and they're, they're, um, they're detached to some extent. I'm not generalizing, but this is a very common observation uh, in our sector. Uh, so, uh, when we talk about localization, we, we it's not about uh, hiring local staff. It's not about only uh, uh, having local partners. Actually, it's a mindset. It's a it's a it's it's a different way of thinking, uh, uh, putting the, the localization lens uh, and decolonization lens when we design our programs, when we generate our knowledge, when we assess, and even with accountability. Usually, our par partners and uh, implementing agencies they're accountable to their donors, not to their communities. Uh, because they are the funders, they are the source of of of, uh, of money, for, for basically, and that's that's the main power dynamic there. Um, what what is the role of philanthropy? I think the philanthropy uh, have the privilege of not uh, coming with that burden of of colonized col uh, colonial legacy, uh, and that gives give uh, a little bit of a window. For philanthropy to to play a role in, in challenging these standards and, and uh, established ways of, of working that, that I, I described earlier, um, they need to be conscious that not to fall into the trap of acting like institutional donors because they they want to be more professional, they want to have systems, and we can see that there is another trend that this this sector is going into that it is very compliance driven. Uh, they are lacking more and more the, the appetite for taking initiatives, for taking risks, for um, testing new approaches and and uh, engaging and they 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 uh, they prefer to follow the safe uh, approaches and safe options that they have used to and their ability to uh, to adapt and to uh, and agility is is very limited um, I'm, I'm sorry again for generalizing but this is this is a broader picture i know that there are some good exceptions uh, but they are, these are big machines that uh, changing them will take will take a lot of time and, and a lot of effort 
while the philanthropy can play a, a more um, dynamic role and, and play a catalyst role in bringing together civil society organizations, uh, local communities, and uh, grassroots organizations, and be the uh, play the, the connections and the pioneers, uh, if I can say, to, to bring that change uh, in, in the way we work and to influence institutional donors. Um, and building their relations. So we can elaborate later on that and how the philanthropy can play uh, that role of bringing uh, together uh, international and uh, uh, institutional donors with local communities and have this create that kind of a platform for exchanging knowledge and uh, and testing and. Uh, um, new approaches and new ways of, of doing things where where communities have the agency uh, of playing a lead role and taking the front seat of leading the, the, the development agenda in, a, in their countries. I will stop here. Thank you, Mona. Um, you started us off with language. Yes. The importance of the language we use because it denotes mindsets. You took us through the value chain from problem statement all the way to impact and accountability. And you ended with a very interesting uh, point that I will ask you more about later, which is you almost responded to one of our um, participants who put in the chat room localization, important topic, a nightmare. You responded by saying, philanthropy has a role to play to get us out of this nightmare. And the philanthropy role is catalytic. It's a pioneering role. It's a daring, courageous role to help bridge between local communities with uh, efforts and experiences and solutions and institutional donors with all of the institutionalization and professionalization um traps that we all fall into thank you Mona very much for your um kickoff remarks we move on now to Amira Amira will bring, bring us now closer to the field Amira Fikri is business development manager on road development with a solid background in project management and community development she has successfully spearheaded various projects focused on empowering marginalized communities and promoting sustainable development. Amira's expertise lies in designing and implementing innovative programs that address social and economic issues, particularly in the areas of market system development, youth development, and women empowerment. Amira, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Noah, for the wonderful introduction. And um, hi, everyone. Uh, so good to be here with you all today, uh, uh, for uh, the, the awesome holiday that we just had. And uh, I want to express all my gratitude to the AFF team for having us here today and for, you know, making this happen because it's, you know, it's time to start really tackling such important topics. Um, so uh, let me let me start by saying that I, I believe that Nelson and Mona did an amazing job in describing localization and how it should be tackled and understood. So maybe I can I can I can start just by reflecting a bit on my journey so far in the sector, um, and by saying that you know it's very important that we all acknowledge the fact that no matter how much you believe that you managed to break your bubble and that you now understand the needs of the people and can help them improve the context, it's never enough. And it's never really true because it's the people who can create the economies that work best for them, which is this really, really important clarity is very important for any intervention to be very effective and very responsive to the people, but most importantly, to be inclusive and uh, reasonable and uh, um, uh, really have an impact. Uh, so going back to en route and, and how we believe localization um, should maybe take place. Uh, well, there are, there are two very important um, lessons learned from previous experience. So the first would be to always know that 
research is an integral part of any activities taking place. It's very important to kick start by understanding what the people need, how can you be inclusive to them, uh, and to adopt the, the necessary tools to onboard them even in the decision making process and in the designing of any intervention taking place. So this is one thing. But actually, the research doesn't is never stops at the beginning of any intervention. It has to um, to go in parallel with every single thing we do because you always have to amend and you always have to have an have an open mind um, towards the effectiveness and whether you're you're actually achieving what you're aspiring to do and if the people are actually res response responding to what you're doing. Um, so this is one very important uh, lesson learned. Uh, but also partnerships with the local actors, I believe, can never be uh, neglected because we have a lot of opportunities and we have a lot of important uh, skills and capacities among our local actors, such as the public universities, the local uh, civil society organizations, the grassroots uh, initiatives and entities. And um, onboarding them very early on in the process really enables them to take ownership over what you're doing which would end uh, uh, in sustaining the activities and the impact that you're trying to achieve. Because without that, you leave and then the impact would inevitably stop because people would not believe in what you're trying to do and how you're trying to help improve uh, the context maybe. Uh, so this is, this is very important and this is why we do not usually operate directly, but we actually have our local offices with the local partners, hiring local uh, members from the local communities, and they know best how to serve the communities. And this helps us really establish mutual trust and respect with the people we're trying to reach out to. Um, so yes, I, I would conclude with this because again, Nelson and Mona, thank you so much for the amazing uh, framing of the topic. Uh, but again, I would like to emphasize on how important it is to be very empathetic and to always have an open mind that it's never enough that you understand the issues. It's very important for the people to communicate and to them state what they need and how they want it to take place. Um, so thank you so much again. And I'm looking forward to the fruitful discussion. Mona, thank you. Um, empathy and communication um a two-way communication yeah is a very very important skill that is often undermined in the development industry we look at expertise professional expertise and we look less in our own teams at the skill of empathy and the skill of effective communication so thank you for making this clear as part of the recipe of successful localization. Now we turn on to Nicholas Dawalidi, last but not least, uh, Deputy Director of Swiss Contact in Lebanon. Uh, Nicholas is born in Lebanon and has a background in mechanical engineering and finance from the American University of Beirut and Notre Dame University in Lebanon. After a long and in, uh, an, a local and international finance and consulting career, in the Gulf and West Africa, Nicholas moved back to Lebanon to work in the development sector. He has 12 years of experience developing and implementing programs in the fields of sustainable agriculture, renewable energies, labor market insertion, TVET education, municipality governance, and more. Happy to have you with us, Nicholas. We'll turn it over to you as our final kickoff uh, statement. Thank you, Noha, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Actually, I just want to point out how delightful it is to be sitting today on a table with such experts and have really these various angles that are being today shared about localization and how each one understands it and how each of them sees it. I mean, after the introduction by Nelson and Muna, um, uh, I think I will also mirror a bit of, of what Amira has said. Um, because we, we approach localization from a very pragmatic point of view as Swiss Contact here in Lebanon, international organization working in Lebanon. And so for me, um, it's always, let's go back to what is the raison d'etre of organizations, of develop, development organizations today. And the way we see it, it's actually really to always find the most fitting and the most sustainable way to impart impact 
on the on the on the environment and the context we are working with today. And as such, looking at the region, I mean, who better to actually have sustainable and op optimal impact than the people who have lived there for the longest time, who know the culture, who know the strategy, who know the history, who know the intricacies of the challenges that are lived by these populations and by these contexts and ecosystems. And as such, today um, we see ourselves, for example, as today we see ourselves as facilitators for these organizations to really be a Rosetta Stone between what they need, what the donor needs, and try to uh, translate this to the donor, but also uh, support in actually making sure that optimize, uh, the donor is optimizing the use of these resources in terms of impact on the ground. And um, so this is, um, this is why we can act as technical backstoppers. I think this is very important. We can act as proper assessors. We can sh and, sh and try and shift really the responsibility and the ownership of these interventions to the local actors and have them carry on from now on. So for me, I, just to end it, I'm going to be very brief. I think that in, uh, our role as, as, as facilitators is really risk mitigation for donors and empowerment of the local of, of, of local organizations in order to carry projects forward, all in really in the, with the vision of optimizing the use of resources for sustainable, for durable, sustainable impact. We always go back to impact. Localization should be about impact, about sustainable impact. In a nutshell, this is it. Nicholas, thank you. Uh, you've provided me with a great segue to the first question I want to uh, pose, uh, and it is inspired by one of uh, the, um, the chat uh, questions uh, in the chat room. Um, impact is something very important that you've mentioned, uh, Nicholas. That should be our North Star. And by working on impact, we've got to take localization seriously. Um, one of the chat conversations is about a question to all of you panelists. Ola elaborate on, is localization about impact, as Nicholas was suggesting in his kickoff speech? Is it about uh, standing up to political agendas? Is it about standing up to Western values and the hegemony of Western values in the development frameworks that we are all using? Or is localization, I would like to add, about solving a riddle, a problem related to local capacities for project management, project execution, uh, institutionalizing certain capacities in the local communities that are there and have the knowledge and have the experience closer to the pulse of the people, but may indeed lack the managerial skills and hence donors run away from them and go to others to as implementing agencies. What is localization from your perspective about? And if you can give one example, I would be very appreciative. Just be a bit more concrete now. If from your experience, is it impact? Is it standing up to agendas and Western values? Or is it solving a problem of implementation related to lack of capacity among the local partners whom we all respect and admire, but find ourselves not able to work with because they are not delivering in a professional manner or something else? Let me start with Muna, move on to Amira and, and with Nicholas, and please be very quick and short and telegraphic so that we can take many questions. Over to you, Muna. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Noha. Uh, in, uh, very quickly, it's um, localization is, is the agency of local communities. It's, uh, it's coming from the local communities where they have the, the they claim the rights and they practice the rights to identify their their problems to design the solutions and to be accountable to their communities uh, this is this is key and they are 
uh, able to tackle all the elements of, of the challenges they have, whether they are political, economic, social, uh, or cultural, or, or in, in a multidimensional and, and I do not hear Muna anymore. Uh, is that a problem for all of you? Okay. Until Muna comes back, um, I will uh, move on to uh, Amira, and then we take Muna as soon as she is back. Amira, over to you. Hello. Yeah, I'm good. So, Hello. Wait. Can you hear me? I, oh, I okay, you Muna, you're, you're back. back. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I lost you for a second. So we still need that exchange of knowledge, of good practice, uh, of uh, at a global level. What's going on in Latin America and Africa and the Middle East and Asia? And we we need these uh, facilitators of knowledge and experience and and, and 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 sharing that knowledge. But that doesn't mean that we have a top down one solution coming from. Uh, uh, an office in New York or somewhere in London to tell everyone that we have a one solution across the board. Uh, having that balance is really important and acknowledging and letting go of power, despite that we have the, the money as donors, we let go power to, to our uh, partners on the ground, the, the, the local communities where they can Lead, uh, lead lead the, the change and lead the development agenda. I can uh, give an example that from from my experience with, with Asfari Foundation that we 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 are stepping away from the program project based funding to strategic funding uh, where the 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 we have a, a core funding for the the civil society organizations where they can allocate that fund. Uh, in the best way they see uh, to build their capacity to address certain issues in the local community. So we 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 think together, but we don't interfere in their priorities and the the way they think, the way they implement, and they are accountable to their communities more than they are accountable to us. Uh, we we become part of the stakeholders uh, that we provide the part of their ecosystem. And we don't impose our agenda. We we have the privilege not to come with a political agenda. Our agenda is bringing change, is community development, but not necessarily to drive the 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 local uh, actors and uh, uh, local civil society in a certain direction. Uh, I think that's a that's a critical role that philanthropy can play, and the the, the institutional donors with time can learn and be comfortable. Uh, to work in, in that. There are certain do institutional donors and international NGOs that are trying to, to experiment and, and get into that uh, area. But I think they, 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 they have to, to overcome a lot of uh, internal challenges uh, regarding to their internal uh, bureaucracy and the inherited way of, of doing things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mona, this is an absolutely important uh, point you've just mentioned. Number one, uh, uh, Rachel Howard in the in the chat room has uh, men mentioned exactly the point you started off with, that there is no one size fits all. We all learn from each other, but there are also local specificities. And that's exactly uh, what you have said, Mona. But then you moved on to say something extremely challenging. I thought you will stop at the, at the statement, but then you moved on to explain it. So thank you for doing that. The, the, the challenging statement was, let go of power. My first reaction was, who does that? <laughs> Nobody lets go of power. But you said a great example of how the Asfari Foundation does it, by funding strategic directions, not projects or even programs, and by making your partners look towards their communities for accountability, not towards you as a funder. The funder becomes just one of the many people your partner has to be accountable to. Thank you for this uh, example. It, uh, it means a lot to think carefully, all of us here around this conversation today, if we are donors, what does it mean to let go of our power? Number one, acknowledge our power. And number two, 
dare to let go of the power. And you've given a good example of how you go about doing that by funding strategic, di strategic directions, not projects or programs and making sure your partner is accountable to the communities. Thank you for that. Amira, bring us down to a concrete example of how localization works from your perspective. Um, okay, uh, maybe I can build on this uh, by going back to the main question. Um, you know, localization is is not one of the different directions. It's, it's not just about the impact or not just about saying no to models that did not work before or to give back the voice to the local actors. It's, it's actually about them all. So we go to Upper Egypt, for instance, and work with the different actors. But, you know, the public universities are very central in Upper Egypt because they are considered a very safe space for youth, for women especially. Uh, they're a very knowledgeable arm and a very important technical arm for the government and the society. They produce the knowledge for the people across the different sectors, so they, they definitely have a very important role, but maybe the role has, has not been well materialized before in the previous interventions and projects and programs. And this is why localization is very important, and it just emphasizes on the need to change, not necessarily because the previous programs were not suitable, but maybe they were suitable for a different context. So yeah, it's very important to give back the voice to the people who know best how to tackle their own issues. And the role of the different grassroots uh, grassroots organizations can never be um, um, this neglected in this context. Um, so yes, the universities would be a very important example for how localization can take place, uh, but also capacitating the different stakeholders across the different levels, especially you know the, the community leaders who, to us might sound like very normal people, but they have a very important role in the lives of the of the local communities that we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, Amira, thank you. The, you've mentioned something extremely important and also very challenging. Um, successful models, whether coming from the global north or coming from global south, or even coming from the same country, successful models don't replicate as easily as we think they do. Each success is idiosyncratic. Each success is a story. And hence, you said, work with people who will help you capture this knowledge. First of all, collect that knowledge, which takes us back to one of AFF, Arab Foundation Forum's greatest missions, which is to help make knowledge an important asset in the development industry and in philanthropy. Collect the knowledge, you're saying to us all, Amira, and then work with others who know how to process this knowledge, such as universities. Um, partner with universities to process the knowledge, because not every success story will replicate the same way in the local uh, level. But then you mentioned something highly important and yet controversial work with local communities. I bet you everyone around this virtual table today, including our participants, has good and bad experiences with working with local communities, local leaders. They come with great innovative solutions many times, but some of them come with very conservative and very closed uh, solutions because they are part of power dynamics. Um, so maybe I'll come back to you after I give the floor to Nicholas and Nelson, uh, in case you have something to tell us about your experience in en route, in working with local communities in a constructive and progressive manner. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to give us some concrete example from your work on how localization worked? Yes, actually, I can. I would love to give an example of how localization would, could have worked marvelously had it been had it been enabled in Lebanon. I will give an example. Um, Fifteen years ago, no, let's say a bit less, maybe ten years ago, and over the course of five or six years, around two hundred thousand Lebanese youth had been trained on short, uh, be it short uh, technical trainings or in the TVET sector. And um, a final assessment was made about these, these. These were training that were delivered by an innumerable amount of organizations and from and from grants coming from several donors. 
Looking back at the Tracer survey, they, we found out that less than 2% of these people found a job in the sector they were trained on. And I like to think that had these actors had been given the opportunity early on to feed back their findings to the donors and to the implementers and to the ecosystem as a whole, we would have been able to avoid such a waste of resources and actually redirected the resources where they would be most needed. And I think this is how we should look at, at things, not in a binary manner, whereby it's either it's through implementation and impact and or through really destroying the hegemony. But let's give them, let's give local actors not only the power to, uh, not only the responsibility to enact a certain project, but also to give them the prerogative and the authority to question it and feed back their questions to the donors so that they can adjust and move forward in the best of ways. Uh, that's very interesting, uh, Nicholas. And uh, there are uh, comments in the chat room that I will refer to in a minute uh, related to this facilitation role that Swiss Contact and many others are actually playing in the Arab region nowadays. And I, when I work with, with the Ford Foundation, uh, I, I saw that real life, uh, how this facilitation role is so very important. So I'll get back to you and refer to some of the chat uh, uh, comments in this respect. But Nelson, anything you would like to add to this conversation of concret concretizing uh, localization from where you sit, looking at world data. Yes, so I think I think there's. I was just thinking that there actually might be one example that I think actually can overcome. Uh, Noah, what you basically said that the the solution here doesn't work there, that things are not entirely transferable or reproducible for a solution here or there. One thing that we've seen from here is that, uh, from kind of the global perspective is that there are also many different types of donors. There are donors that are more localized than others. So for instance, one, 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 one good example that we have seen on how to overcome the localization channel challenge is uh, uh, when, for instance, a group of donors, of local donors, for instance, in this case, uh, a group of, I think something like around 50 uh, philanthropic donors in Colombia, set together a little network so that they can work a little bit closer together uh, also to overcome the bias of learning more from successes than from failures. Philanthropy ultimately is all the time uh, doing more and more and exploring more and more. So there's a little bit of a bias of learning more from, from the few successes and not from all the big failures that actually need to be communicated more. And what they actually did was pull together all of the information from their programs, all of the information from their financing, and then raise up a hand and say, hey, we are great at co-financing work. We're doing this program here. We're way localized. We can understand the conflict uh, happening in Colombia. We can understand the context of the history. Uh, is an international donor looking to match our financing for increasing our program? So this, actually, this solution actually solves two things. International donors have more availability of funding, but have less information. Local donors have way less resources, but they have way more information. But these two groups of donors are perfect partners because they both have skin in the game that they can put to increase both of their operations and their, their kind of their, their objectives. And at the same time, localizing the work a lot more. So I think this might be an actual, this is one of my, from what I've seen uh, so far internationally, one of the best solutions for kind of nuancing a little bit the distance between the very large and distant uh, international philanthropic donor to the local one that also faces the problem in their own country. Uh, and and I, I think that this might be a very promising solution to work elsewhere. This requires donors to actually sit together, work together, have an agenda, be more open about their information, be about more open about where they fail. It's not only about the successes. The successes are shiny and nice and easy to put in beautiful reports, but a lot of the time they're failures. And sometimes I think um, if, 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 if local donors are capable of, of, of showing everybody how they're also learning from their, their failures, they give a much more stronger signal that they're worthy partners. So um, that, that's kind of the example. I hope it didn't take too long to explain. Fantastic, Nelson, um, on, on different levels. I, I, the message about dare to fail, but be responsible for learning from failure. 
is a very powerful message. And many, many more philanthropy organizations that are strategic in the thinking are developing this culture within their own teams. I can say the Ford Foundation, I, I'm uh, so proud to have worked with for over 10 years, has that, and I'm sure many other philanthropy organizations, including in the, in the Arab region, such as Asfari, as we have heard, Mona, have that ethos now, dare to fail, but be accountable for learning from failure. And number two, dare to share the lessons, both success and failure. Uh, it might sound funny. Yeah? What does it mean, dare to share? Yes, we're not sharing enough. So dare to share. And then you made another point about this bridging between those who have the power, money, and models, and those who have the embedded knowledge and no power, no money, and how you bring those together. And here is where the chat room has some very interesting points about those who are saying that uh, subgranting is a very important skill that allows those who are in the, in the level in between the local grassroots and the big funders, there is a level in between that can do subgranting because they are closer to the field and yet they know the language of the big funders. So th they bridge the language and they bridge the knowledge from the local. And I can tell you the Arab region and many other regions around the world in the global South are increasingly learning the subgranting skills. Uh, how to subgrant, whom to subgrant to, and while you're subgranting, you shouldn't be only giving money, but as in the chat room has been said as well, give the mentoring and the management skills needed on, on, on the local level. Give that one too. And those in between infrastructure organizations are trying to do that nowadays. Someone in the chat room mentioned the cultural sector as being a sector that does the very good and powerful subgranting and very good capacity development and capacity mentoring to the local communities. And I agree, the cultural sector in the Arab world is leading in that, in that area. Um, this has been so far a good uh, um, teaser on, on, the, on the conversation today. Um, I can see another uh, uh, example from Nisreen uh, uh, Hajj in the, in the chat room uh, about the Rawa Fund in Palestine, uh, which is another example of collaborative uh, government uh, for the local level communities and the fund uh, um, uh, mobilization for local level communities. Um, the region actually has a lot to offer. Uh, if we all document those cases and create um, a bank, a, a knowledge bank for all these cases uh, that will help localization. I would like to go back, if you allow me, all of you, to the local leaders uh, point that was made by Amira. Uh, I'll ask Amira to dare to tell us her experience with local leaders, good or bad, because this will take me from that point to a point related to something we should not ever forget, that the Arab region is full nowadays of conflict contexts, countries in conflict or coming out of conflict. And again, the issue of localization here is tricky, but very, very important, including working with local leaders. But, and I will ask Mona to maybe comment on that and then Nicholas. But let me start with Amira. You brought the issue of local leaders into the picture. So please tell us your experience before I move on to Mona and Nicholas on conflict context. Over yes, to you. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll do what I like to do best and bring to the table some market system development terminologies. Um, so yes, stakeholder, engage, stakeholder engagement is very, very crucial to render any activity you know, effective again. So how do we do this normally? You start by assessing the ecosystem from the scope that you're focusing on. So for us, we're mostly working on economic empowerment and we focus on youth and women. So looking at the different actors who have a significant role in Upper Egypt, it was it was very evident that the public universities were the key actor to do that, but they have long been not neglected, but not really focused on by ongoing efforts. And this necessitated a lot of you know, attention and effort 
towards including them in ongoing activities. And this is why our units are actually operated by people from the university, whether academic or administrative staff. And these people undergo continuous training from our side and from other entities as well through our programs so that they're always updated and capacitated to not just benefit our own target beneficiaries, but also have the knowledge and transmit the knowledge to the students, which would end up scaling the impact. Um, and by impact here, I would, I'm not just um, uh, talking about the opportunities that exist in the sector, but also how to tackle these opportunities, how to have an open mind and an entrepreneurial mindset uh, in approaching the different opportunities, how to um, uh, start a career in any sector, depending on your skills and how to know what your skills are to begin with. So this is all knowledge that we try to capacitate the university staff on, again, to transmit to the right actors. Um, so, so again, the first movers would be the university, but also there are other, other actors actively engaged in the different scenes. So, and this, again, since we're talking about localization, it's very important to know that there is no one actor for all of us to go and um, approach, because this would be extremely wrong. So again, for, for us, economic empowerment would take place through the university, but it's very important to know that other fields would require different actors as well, such as the local community leaders in rural areas who have a, a very important role in elevating awareness regarding the different social issues and health issues that they face. And this has been very effective through different interventions by other, other stakeholders in Egypt as well. So this is my take on it. And it should not be easy. Change is, is really hard. And it, you should fail multiple times before you know what is the right approach to do that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amira. <laughs> Again, for hammering on, don't be afraid of failure, but learn from it. Otherwise, it's stupid to make the same mistake twice. <laughs> um, I want to go back to Mona and Nicholas on my question related to working with local communities, particularly in conflict uh, contexts, but also pick up on Barbara Ibrahim's point in the chat about local communities uh, as a reflection of uh, the larger societies and local communities reflecting the power imbalances that are present in any society. How do you deal with that if you are committed to working with local leaders and make sure that you avoid or disrupt the power imbalances that they may naturally reflect. Mm. Who wants to get to that, Mona? Yes, I can start and allow me to be a bit challenging here when we talk about local communities and local leaders. And I'm afraid that we also tackle that from a colonial perspective. Uh, because when colonialism used local leaders and traditional structures to, to access communities that they colonialized uh, centuries ago and through, through the centuries to control these communities. And by doing that, they strengthen the existing uh, traditional structures, religious structures, and, and, and automatically hindered the development and the change in, the, in these societies and in these countries and in these contexts. And we're also looking at the, the, again, from a colonial perspective to local communities as if they are flat. They have their own power dynamics. They have their own uh, conflicts, despite of the, 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 the uh, the external and foreign factors. They, they have their classist uh, uh, issues, they have their eth ethical, ethnical is issues, they have their religious issues, and there are a lot of uh, dynamics in there. And sometimes when we address the development issue, we, we look at them in a very flat, uh, flat way without looking at these multi-dimensional and multi and, and addressing these communities through the, the existing local structures that has been empowered over time because of their uh, socioeconomic status, because of their religious uh, or tribal uh, uh, backgrounds, 
this emphasizes the existing and strengthen the existing structures and and hinder the the uh, uh, and stop the the change. And a context like Lebanon can be an, a very good example in that the the all through the development we used the sectarian divisions uh, and the sectarian leaders to be the lead in the development. And we ended up with a civil society that is divided across the sectarian uh, kind of, uh, yeah, divisions in, in the community. And it applies to, to, to all other contexts as well. So going back to the, to the humanitarian context, which applies to this as well, we, we use our, the aid, uh, uh, architecture, the humanitarian architecture, does not really acknowledge civil society role as a political agent uh, in in the in the humanitarian response. The recipients of aid, we set up refugee camps that can exist for decades uh, in a certain set setup, and people are don't have access to work, they don't have access to proper services, they don't have access to political rights, they don't have, they don't have access to, to, to have a, a, a political representation in the hosting countries and in, in, in the, the areas that they ended up in. And they are, always have other agents talking on their behalf and representing them. And in the best case scenarios, we have uh, community consultations. We we bring the muhtar and the religious reader and the, the priest and the imam and to represent these ma ma these are uh, diverse communities and and they have they they're, they're complicated and complex communities and we uh, uh, simplify them and we we just. Uh, they shrink, they're, they're only seen through these uh, representatives that are selected by individuals who are working in these NGOs or in these UN agencies. Uh, and they're not representing organically the, their communities. I think that there, uh, there is a big issue there uh, when it comes to uh, the, the humanitarian responses and in, in, in um, in our region, and and I think it's a global it's a global issue that needs to be discussed. Thank you, Mona. I see Nisreen Hajj in the chat room asking a very interesting and challenging question. But before I get to that, uh, Nicholas Nelson or Amira, any points you'd like to make related to this idea of working with local communities that actually reflect power imbalances as well uh, and leader local leaders in particular and if anyone can give an example from your own experience in a conflict context of which there are unfortunately many in the arab region right now i'd be also very grateful uh, before we uh, tackle Nisreen Hajj's question, anyone wants to come in? I, I just want to add to what Mona said. I think she really uh, summarized it very, very well. But also, I, having worked in the development sector in Lebanon for the past 12 years, there is one thing that I have also noticed is that the ecosystem has filtered itself in a way. And today, the organizations that are the most impactful are the organizations who have been able to cross these uh, these uh, tribal slash religious uh, barriers that are there. And this is where we come in to identify those and support them in actually uh, having access to more resources and to more impact further down the line. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. I think you've, you've made a very good point here. Lebanon is a good example, but there are also others, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Palestine, uh, and we can move, go on all the way to Libya too. Um, those organizations are there that are trying to c c bridge between the divisions, be they religious or ethnic, but we just have to find them and, and, and commit to working with them. And here is a question to you, Nicholas, before I move on. From 20, 2019 onwards in Lebanon, we have noticed that when those organizations succeeded in setting some of the agenda points in Lebanon, 2019 onwards, there came a point where one hits the glass ceiling. For you to make a difference, you need to move on to much bigger changes. Um, and they were stuck. Do they form political parties? 
and may do the bigger changes through elections, or they do they turn around and become community organizations and continue to work on the local level. And they are somewhere in between. Add to that professional associations like doctors and engineers and whatever, and then the, the, this local community ecosystem becomes too complex. Okay, what is Swiss Contacts uh, uh, experience with that? Because we've been so far talking about it as if it's a homogeneous lot, but in fact, it's not. Local communities are extremely complex and don't know at one point in time after initial success where to move from here, move upward, scaling up the success or continue to deepen locally uh, the successes that they've had. Over to you. Yeah. Well, in, in times of crisis, it's inter always in times of crisis, you have a boom of new organizations and new actors that try to always play a role. And it is only normal. It's the way things are. With time, some of them will wither away, others will consolidate, while others will try to move forward. And I think there is no one, uh, one scenario that has actually happened in Lebanon or one right answer that has worked for everyone. Uh, some have really refocused on, the, on their core values and their core uh, expertise. Others have just disbanded because they didn't have a role to play anymore, while others really tried to push through. But this is where also you hit, the, 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 as you said, the glass ceiling is not, is not all, always external. It is sometimes also internal for lack of competence, for lack of access, for lack of funding. It becomes a problem that is within the organization preventing them from moving forward. Again, bringing us to the point where what can we do about it? And this is where we came in. And so if there was any to anywhere where we could offer the technical backstopping that was needed or the access to a network that was needed because we saw that there was potential, this is where we as Swiss Contact actually uh, intervened and tried to support these organizations. Uh, Amira, Nelson, anything else you'd like to add to this conversation? Of course, there is a lot to say here, but uh, <laughs> I I don't know. I'm trying to be okay. If I if I if I would think of um, something that would be very important to to address conflicts uh, in a very timely manner, especially where we have flues of um, of uh, Sudanese coming to Egypt, that it's very important to not just bridge between the different actors, but the policies are also very important. Um, and there needs to be a very strong engine that promotes inclusive policies while onboarding the different actors, while also ensuring that internal ceilings and external ceilings are adaptive of the needs of the people. This is you know, very important um, to also consider maybe. Well, as the Dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at AUC, uh, what you said is music to my ears. <laughs> work is very much related to an enabling or disabling environment, yeah. regulations and policies. And that's an important skill to enlist in many of the teams that work locally to, be, to understand the enabling environment and know how to navigate it as well, including the environment of policies. Um, Nisreen Haj had a question and we are coming now to the last 15 minutes of our session today. Nisreen is asking how, if you are committed to that value of shifting power from the big donor to the local community organizations, how do you shift the, the, ensure that you are also able to shift the power downwards from those communities to the so-called beneficiaries who are actually not beneficiaries, they should also be in the driving seats. Any examples that any of you has of how your partners on the local level have adopted this culture of shifting the power imbalance from them downwards? Um, I can actually add something here, but uh, I think I think our experience has been very different and we've been very lucky because we worked with donors who adopted a completely different mindset where they're actually very aware of the local, not aware of the local needs, but aware of the importance of reflecting these needs in their programs, even though they themselves have very restricting targets and indicators that they have to still report on. But they're trying to break this by 
coming with us to uh, to the field to see how things take place and to go and talk to the people themselves and we would translate so that everyone is aligned on what's happening and this has been very very uh, enlightening because it's very important again to be empathetic and to understand the people but again it's never enough and they have to be part of the decision making mechanism so somehow i don't have the answer on how to do that but maybe that's a start and maybe today's discussion is a start to something big bigger to take place because this started becoming a, an integral part of the discourse nowadays which is very important Nelson, could I ask you to tell us from the broad perspective of the databases that you are looking at across the whole world, uh, where are you seeing the most dense network of lo successful localization taking place? And what would be the indicators that you, are, you would suggest to AFF if it wants to follow a trend of localization in the Arab world? Let's just uh, spend some time asking each other in the as a panel um which region can we can we benefit from uh, nelson if there is any and then what indicators of localization would be good for aff to track to track and trace uh, in the arab region moving forward okay great i get the the curveball the very hard question at the end of the session <laughs> Um, so I'm 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 not I, I'm not exactly sure what would count for like so two parts right so the first part is like what like who has been able to put this together like who's a uh, uh, who can we follow who can we see and observe that they're doing a good work and for this I think maybe the most important thing which is this kind of unspoken truth about the philanthropic sector which is it's way more about the relationships between people and even the people within the foundations and the donors and the grantees. Then, we're, then what it is about the goals and the targets and the strategies and the objectives and the projects. So the relationships between the donors and the grantees, the, even the personal ones, the name bases, the WhatsApp chats, the what, like these communication channels matter a lot in building this trust. So um, I'm not sure what would be a good example. I think we've seen a couple of brewing networks that have been able to produce this type of of solid knowledge, credible commitments, and, and, and expand their work by signaling internationally what they can do. Uh, again, my, my favorite example is Colombia, but there's also uh, a very cool collaborative in, in India related to climate change. Uh, there's also a very interesting group of uh, philanthropic organizations in South Africa that are kind of already doing the same, but they're a little bit younger. It takes decades it takes a, it took a decade to this group of organizations in Colombia to build this, this social infrastructure. And in terms of how do you measure this, actually, I, we did come up with an idea. So we, we have this huge global database. We have hundreds and thousands of grants from hundreds of organizations from all over the world. Imagine if we could measure how many resources these large organizations actually give to proper names NGOs versus large international NGOs, and that we can compare actually what is their degree of delegation that they give to re-grantors versus to the actual local organization that is actually going to receive it as an endpoint. So uh, that's probably something that is doable, uh, maybe with some caveats, but I would maybe come up with an indicator of like who's funding re-grantors versus who's funding the uh, endpoint NGOs who are really doing the grassroots work. Uh, maybe if if if. This is, I, I think it would be doable with the data that we have. Uh, I, we haven't done it, but it's a wonderful idea from a very tough question that you sent my way, No. <laughs> Happy to continue the conversation with you on that because <laughs> uh, of course, uh, where I sit institutionally is about knowledge production. So um, um, uh, Mona, Amira and Nicholas, uh, any uh, thoughts on what indicators of localization could we track moving forward? Um, I'm, I'm going to give an example that might uh, fit beyond, uh, address the, the, the question. Um, recently, from the Aspari Foundation, we, we managed to be a co-funder for local civil society organizations. 
to get funds from one of the largest donors in the region, uh, institutional donors and, and, and government donors in, in the region. And we stepped in to support uh, the, the local actors to compete for that huge funding. And we provided guarantees for the, the institutional donor that we will help these uh, this consortium of local donors, uh, of local uh, uh, organizations, if they come together, we will we will co we will fund them. We will co-fund them, but to support their strategic objectives and to build their internal capacity to be able to manage and to implement uh, to and to manage that multi-million uh, fund in their local areas and in their local. And I think with this approach, we can influence both. We can influence the local actors, uh, strengthening them and empowering them. And we, we tell them that we are behind your back. You can go and, and approach these large donors. Don't be intimidated by being uh, negotiating with these uh, strong big donors and competing with large international NGOs and play actors. And at the same time, we sit with the, this institutional donor and say that uh, we provide, provide guarantees uh, and core support for that implementing local implementing uh, consortium and partners to be able to achieve the goals and, and implement and then take it to a, another level where they can uh, sustain their program and have a lo lasting impact in their communities. Uh, that can bring an, an, a new way of doing work. And I know that there are other, other donors who are coming together and building coalitions of donors, but having a, a philanthropy from the region, uh, co-funding a large institutional uh, grant for a local agent uh, uh, to support civil society and, and, and to just enter that, that arena that has been always controlled by international actors and international NGOs and, and, and these big contractors. I think that was, a, we saw that as a big uh, breakthrough uh, that supported, and, and the, the, to give the credit for that international uh, institutional donor, that they embraced that uh, initiative from our side and from the local uh, actors uh, side as well and give it a try. And they, so our, our role was also encouraging for that institutional donor to, to step out from their comfort zone and to test the, 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 that in a new initiative with, with local partners. Uh, and we we're yet to see how it will evolve, how we will, and we will capture the learning, and and we will see how it will it will work. Uh, but I think that's a, that's an example of how philanthropy can play a role in in, in bridging that gap between uh, large uh, institutional donors and local actors and and uh, local civil society organizations. I thank you, Mona. And I also thank Nisreen Hajj in the chat room to everyone for the examples she's, she's given. Uh, these are really good examples that I hope AFF will, um, will take note of and, and, and help Nisreen document further. Uh, she's given us hyperlinks to things that we can read in the case of La uh, Tab Tabruna campaign, uh, Women Now, and uh, another example of shifting power uh, in a six minute campaign from, from Rouad. Um, so uh, this is a question that should uh, keep us uh, uh, busy for some time to come, how to, as she puts it, shift this power uh, downwards towards uh, not from low meaning from local communities to the so-called ben beneficiaries. Um, so thank you, Nisreen, for the the examples you've given in the chat room. I would add maybe uh, suggested indicators uh, like uh, Nelson, how much money is is being put by the big donors and the sub granting donors into institutional building. Uh, of, of local organizations, uh, not only project implementation, but actually institutional building grants. Um, uh, something that both Asfari and Ford Foundation are doing in the Arab region very well. 
and some of the sub grantors in the Arab region are actually adopting as well, be that the Arab uh, Fund for Arts and Culture, uh, Cultural Resource, or others. Arab Council for Social Sciences, all these are those sub grantors that are now starting to look at institutional building. So tracking how much of the money is not just for projects, but either for strategic directions or for institutional building locally would be one uh, possible uh, indicator. The other one is how much money is actually going into learning. The percentage of money that is spent on documentation and learning, uh, not impact assessment from the log frame perspective, but from a perspective of deep documentation and deep reflective learning. That would maybe be uh, another example. We're coming very, very close to the end of this conversation. I cannot thank the panelists enough for this. Nicholas wants to say something. Yes, I'll, give I each one of you, I'll give each one of you a minute to, to say a last thought before we close up. Nicholas, we'll start with you. Yes, hopefully it will, be, it will take less than a minute. One of the indicators we actually use to see if you want, it can be used to gauge localization is one of our main axes of intervention is what we call institutional development of our partners. And from the beginning of our, of our intervention with our partner until the end, we usually work in four year, four year phases. We see how much at the, at the beginning was, was their competence that we needed to bring to the table. And by the end of that phase, how much of it was already integrated at, at the with our partner and we did not need it anymore. So we had transferred that knowledge, transferred that expertise to our partner. And I think this is a very important tangible uh, indicator we should be looking at. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Nelson and Amira, any last thoughts? Uh, I just have maybe one thing, uh, because those two questions that you're asking, we are already preparing answers for. So my colleague, Emma, who's here uh, in, in, in this conference today is an attendee. She's working very hard on pulling together the data that will answer both of them. So we hope to put together a very short paper by the end of this year where they will have both information on the two indicators that you just mentioned. So I think uh, look forward to, to be able to share with that this with the community of AFF as well. So this is a request for AFF to have another webinar on those answers once uh, OECD is ready. Um, Amira, any final thought? Um, may, maybe I can just say that, you know, from just observing how the sector usually operates, it's at, at every given time, there is a very trendy, you know, idea that everyone focuses on. And now localization has become very, very dominant which again is very promising because we are at the end of the day, we are the actors who can facilitate the change and empower the local communities. So this is again, very promising. Um, I couldn't be happier to be part of this. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else is yet to come. Great. We are almost at the hour. I would like to thank the panelists very much for this conversation. And I'd like to summarize four guiding principles that we heard repeatedly today from all of our great distinguished panelists. Do your research, collect your data, document your experience, respect your partners as equals in the whole value chain of the development work, share, dare to share your knowledge, dare to make mistakes and learn from them, empower, don't extract and do transactional relationships to implement projects, but build capacities and help the local institutions because they are the ones who are staying in the field when all of us go and move on to new topics and themes. And humility and empathy, these are very important skills that you should give to all of your teams if you are serious about localization and sustainable inclusive development. Thank you for making me part of this important conversation. And back to you, Naila Faroui from AFL. Thank you so much, Noha. Thank you so much to the panelists um, and to everyone asking questions and commenting. Honestly, I feel like this conversation can just keep going and going and going. Um, it's so incredibly important. Um, you know, I'm I'm in the middle of a of a graduate course now that I'm taking, and some of my fellows um, 
with my cohort are on this call today. And this is exactly the, the, the subject of the course that we're taking, which is around localization and, um, and localization in a global kind of context around philanthropy and development aid. So you've given us so much to think about as we kind of go through the theoretical side of this. Um, so just two, three very quick things I was gonna say. The first is, and I love that the panelists brought in the conversation around the decolonization of aid and um, and philanthropy. Uh, and I, you know, often just sitting in this space as the, you know, one of the only networks in the region that focuses on philanthropy and uh, philanthropic actors and and um, um, and other actors in the development space and civil society in the Arab region is I'm often, you know, kind of drumming this idea that. For us to decolonize the sector, we also need to start by decolonizing ourselves, right? So we still have a lot of this in our own kind of approach and our own perspectives. Um, and for you who don't speak Arabic, all the Tlhawega is the foreigners complex, the complex that what's coming from outside is better than what we have inside. Um, I've worked across both sides of the globe, um, north, south, east, and west, so all four sides of the globe, and I can tell you. Uh, very confidently that that is not true. <laughs> there is, you know, we have so much to offer. Um, and and I think it's been very much, I mean, it's been proven by the, the expertise on this panel today. It's very obvious that every one of these people who've spoken today really come from that place where they, where we believe very, very strongly that what we have locally is just as, if not in many cases, more useful than what we get from outside. Um, and it's just a question of how we position ourselves and then also how much faith we put in our own knowledge, expertise, experience, et cetera. And then how we position it in, in the visibility on global platforms. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanna say is around um, dare to share know how you've just given me our new hashtag. <laughs> so the Air Foundations Forum in in partnership with several other organizations, including Dahlberg Advisors and uh, the uh, Center for Strategic Philanthropy at Cambridge and Philanthropy Age, um, we're, we've launched the third round of our Arab Philanthropy Survey, which is a comprehensive region wide survey across all uh, our network and you know members and non members of the AFF network. Um, so I'm gonna use, you know, hashtag dare to share as kind of the call to action for sharing data because that's, you know, it's the most comprehensive, the most in-depth uh, survey that we've attempted so far and we need people to respond. Um, so on that note, thank you so much. Noha, thank you so much for leading this wonderful, wonderful presentation of panelists and their incredible input and feedback. And, you know, we'll, we look forward to hosting you all again soon. Thanks. Bye.